I want to give you guys a little a flavor here of how I take notes, how I do my own learning through these meetings, right? So I'm going to do is show you my camera. I'm going to flip my camera around so you can start to see my notes and an effort to be able to help facilitate everybody getting the most out of these sessions. So you can see here where I started to like chart out for Chris and Brendan. Uh, here's all of the different pieces that I picked up from them, right? The brand does QuickBooks, his accounting keeps my, his mind in the business. And we also knew here that we knew that the core driver for Brendan and doing what it was, was he wanted like the peace of mind of knowing it's done right, right? So that tells us like, okay, somebody's going to operate this way. What is a, operating this way effective towards? Well, it's effective towards like a peace of mind initiative that we have with it, right? And then he can know that his expenses are clear. Um, and that it gives them like a true ROI is what he identified here of what's really going on with his properties and really understanding what happens with that. So Chris identified for us, it says like, hey, listen, when we start to get anything that's at scale, you're going to want to do any stuff that's online and you're going to want to make sure that you have strict rules, that things are in order for how they're going to go. And that it's really important. Why is it so important? Because he's had great partnerships. It would have been really, really probably lucrative for him financially if they would have worked out, but they went south because this piece wasn't addressed appropriately. And once that partnership starts to go south, you start to lose trust, the partnership's crap. You have to find a new person, right? And now like that's a whole reset of potentially tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars because we just, we did a system that didn't work. Right, we we assumed something was going to work here that did it. Right, hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Also, heard, what's up, Chris? Uh, you're right, hundreds of thousands. I've lost hundreds of thousands I've of dollars. Bookkeeping. That's it for bookkeeping. Right, yeah. a bookkeeping cost is what kept us from making hundreds of thousands of dollars. No, no, I lost hundreds of thousands. <laughs> lost hundreds, even worse. Right. Yeah. Not into it. Right. Yep. Yep. And that we also, Chris also identified for us here is that if this is a garbage in, garbage out type of activity. That if what you're putting inside of your books is garbage, then the insights that you get are also garbage. One of the reasons that Brendan is so uh, so keen on doing all of this extra work is because it gives him peace of mind. But it's also he's making sure because he's managing it to the degree he said, no, I don't got garbage. I got diamonds. I'm polishing these numbers. I'm making sure I know every cent is coming out because from there, that's what gives him the insights about how the ROI is doing on his properties. It's also, from what I heard from Chris, is this is also the ROI I'm going to get from using a CFO or a CPA. Because my CPA, what does everybody want when they go to the CPA, right? They say, I hear this all the time. I want tax strategy. I want proactive tax strategies. I want my CPA coming to me and telling me what do I need to be doing different to make more money and how I can take advantage of the taxes. Cool. Well, is this happening? Because if not, how are we ever going to get to ta that? Right. Because if this is not uh, done in the appropriate way, then how can we ever get to the appropriate tax strategy? In fact, if you listen to Brendan uh, into it, he'd probably tell you, well, pff, much less tax strategy. Do you even know how much money you're making to know how much you should be trying to save on taxes? Probably not. Right. So what I'm hearing from you guys is like, no, our bookkeeping and what I'm learning is like, hey, our bookkeeping, we actually feel that this is essential for us to be able to have peace of mind of knowing that our business is operating correctly or our business, our business partnerships are operating correctly, how those businesses are truly performing for us in terms of our top line revenue, how much money are we actually making, and that we can forget about doing anything that's more advanced, like proactive tax strategies, uh, until we get this cleared out because it's garbage in, garbage out that nobody's gonna be prepared to be able to really help you at, a, at an, an intensive level. Sure, we're gonna be able to look at some general practices on tax strategy. Hey, maybe solo 401k, right? Maybe maybe some just generalized things, maybe shelter stuff through your auto or through your kids, your home office deduction, that kind of thing. But the really, the really detailed, the really powerful, the really exact tax strategies, that has to come from that. <laughs> And then I also learned from Chris so far today here too, is that there's actually, he has this in three different stages. He'll do it. If it's a low transaction and it's personal business, he's going to do self. And that reminds me a lot of like what Brendan's doing here. And that if he has a partner and he'll have a partner do it, if it's high transactions and the partner has to have it as part of their, one of their core responsibilities, that if it's an operational based partner, he says, Hey, you're in charge of the bookkeeping. You're agreeing to be on top of this and to whatever in order means for us that we're going to agree on. I have to be a practice for that. And do you agree to that? If so, then the partner will take that on. And then if, if it looks like the partner's like, no, I can't take that on. I says, okay, cool. That's where we're going to pay somebody else because we're too busy. 
to actually get to the level of quality we need here. But what I hear from Chris is we would never sacrifice the level of quality because the cost of not having the quality is too high. Because 100%. Of- and even if they're willing to do it, if their time is better spent elsewhere, then we're going to get a bookkeeper because a bookkeeper is a lot less expensive than somebody who's good at finding good de- uh, new deals. So uh, that would be like if you partnered with Brendan, right? And you're like, you go to bring like, Brendan's like, no, I can lock in 10 more deals, but I'm trying to figure out where this $132 in escrow is, right? And you'd say, no, Brendan, we're hiring a bookkeeper for a hundred bucks a month, man. Go and find, go get those deals, right? <laughs> that would be the analogy, the analogy there, right? Fair to say, right? 100%. Right? And to it. But you'd probably say, amazing, Brandon, you really understand your business. We've teed up exactly what we need to be able to go pass it off to a bookkeeper and make sure the system is going to run the right way, right? So it's not like setting this up yourself goes to waste, right? It's actually setting up a system you understand. So there's a, probably a lot of good value for everybody that's listening to this is like, hey, I'm self-managing my books. That's amazing. Is that at the level that you really want it to be? Is it really giving you the insights about how your true ROI is? Is it really setting up your CPA to be able to tell you whether it's Pete in the, here inside of Royal Legal Solutions or somewhere else, are they really set up to be able to give you the kinds of insights you're asking for when you're saying, hey, I'm frustrated because I'm not getting proactive tax strategy? Well, how well are you setting them up to be able to do that, right? And maybe there's some things here to understand about when do we outsource, when do we not into it? And then if we are doing it personally currently, is, it, is that inside of our budget to say, hey, if I wasn't doing this bookkeeping, you know? And one is my bookkeeping at the quality standard. I'm going to say probably not to be able to get there. Just kind of shooting off the cuff. Most people don't. This is the number one area people slack on as their bookkeeping, right? But if that's not being done, then cool. Then set the standards, just like Chris was talking about, of like what in order means to you or talk to Chris or talk to us about what those standards look like. Get that system set up the right way. And then cool, then pass it off to a bookkeeper and focus on the more dollar productive activities. If you can't be more dollar productive than your bookkeeping, then we need to have another talk about like how to make money in the world. Because I can guarantee everybody here is on this call. The fact that you're in this call tells me that you're somebody who's serious about what your financial future is going to look like. And also you have the brains to be able to put together deals and make money and that it shouldn't be put into administrative stuff unless the administrative pieces are necessary for you to understand like they are for Brendan about like, how is this business actually working? Right. And having, having that work or Chris with his oversight of other people. Cool. So I just want to break that down for you guys because everybody's like, well, what do I do for my bookkeeping? Right. What do I do for my bookkeeping and accounting? What else have you was like, hey, it depends. And that was the purpose of this conversation we had right here is to say, hey, what does it depend on? Right. And so this is the kind of thinking if we were in a one on one consult with me and Pete, that this would be the, the type of conversation we would have about what is the appropriate level for bookkeeping, just like we talked about the appropriate level for tax and such. I, I was just going to make a comment, too. I, I think it's human nature sometimes that we look at something we're not good at and just say, ah, you know, I'm just not good at that. I'm just going to ignore that part and focus on what I'm good at. And, and I really, truly feel bookkeeping is one of those things that you just, you can't ignore the basic principles. Uh, and even if you give 100% of it over to somebody else, if you don't understand what the information is going into that, it's not just so that it's set up for your CPA to do your taxes. It's really so that you can have a better idea of your business in real time or close to real time uh, of how you're doing and where you should focus. Um, so it's something a lot of people fight against. A lot of people think that they're not good at it, but there's the basic tenets are, are so important to understand. And it's, it's pivotal to any successful business to know where the numbers are at. Otherwise you're failing and you don't even know it or you're succeeding brilliantly and not knowing it, not giving yourself enough credit. Yeah. Or, or not know how to accelerate the success. Right. Yeah. That's another like piece of it too. Um, so when we think about our path to financial freedom, right? And building the legacy that we want. There's two of the most important pieces that we always talk about on the very top of that freedom temple. You guys know, like on the Royal Legal Solutions website, we have that graphic that's like the temple. And at the very top of the temple is wealth creation, right? Because until you're creating money out there, none of the rest of the stuff matters, right? Until you have, you have to start making money first. And then what's number two? It's tax strategy. Right? Save money is number two. Save money, right. Cut you down expenses. You got to save it. You got to build you it. Save it. It's because it's not about how much you make, right? It's how much you keep, right? That's the game. So when we talk about what's the goal here, 
what I've heard is like, there's two major goals. It's a better understanding of your most dollar productive activities. This is what Brendan was getting to, right? He's really, and Chris was losing on it saying, when I really understand my bookkeeping and accounting, I can really understand what is the most dollar productive activity I can make out of here, right? How can I really influence it? And the second thing to do is, well, hey, can it also set up my CPA to help me save money on my taxes? So this is the making money part of the equation. And this is the saving money, keeping the money part of the equation. Now we know we have a bunch of other stuff like asset protection and insurance and all that kind of other good stuff. That's keeping money, but in a different context. Right now, like this is just the money, money, keeping the money part, right? I thought we have it. Not all the other things that can happen to us um, along the way that we have to cover off, off um, on the risk about. Um, so I was thinking, what do you guys think um, about having like a quick discussion about for everybody here and for the benefit of everybody here is um, how would we approach bookkeeping or how would we advise like that typical investor that has somewhere between like zero to 10 properties, you know, to it that are thinking about like their bookkeeping. And, and they heard Chris just say, Hey, you really want to make sure you're doing this right. And we were learning from Brendan. Hey, we were, Brendan Sellers is really focused on making sure this is done right. But they're still kind of at that place of saying, I don't really know what to do. And I'm, I'm in a place that says, I kind of want to see if I can figure this out on my own before I just punt it to a professional because maybe I'm, I'm, I'm cash strapped at the moment, right? Or that I really want to figure it out on my own first so I can really understand it. But I don't really know what are the first steps to take and going about doing it. So what would we advise as a community about what would, what would be the appropriate approach uh, for somebody to take here while they're on this mission? They're on the Chris mission, which is, how do I first set up everything for myself and this where Chris and Brendan are at for some of their activities? And then how do I migrate to partners to the outsource professionals that come with it? And if we just focused here, like on the self part for right now, what would be important for us on that? But Chris, go ahead and take us away. Everybody else, raise your hand if you have some ideas here as you're listening to Chris. Well, the first thing, and 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 take this the right way, Scott, because I'm going to give you a little, maybe a little too much flattery, uh, but uh, you are an expert at listening. And I think the first thing when you're dealing with somebody who's new at something is really ask some questions and shut up and listen and, and really get an idea of where are, where, are, where are their expertise in terms of bookkeeping? Do they have, a, I don't know, an MBA in finance? I mean, if you're talking to somebody like that, it's going to be much different than somebody who, uh, you know, has a high school education, and hates math. Uh, nothing against that. There's plenty of really successful people in real estate with just a high school education. But the approach is going to be different. So if, uh, you know, and ask them, you know, they have four, 10 properties now. Uh, so what has been their process so far? Is, is it out of state? Do they have a property manager? Are they managing it themselves? If it's a property manager, most of them already have probably a considerable amount of your bookkeeping already taken for you. Uh, and if they're already monthly sending you a profit and loss statement, well, let me put it this way. If they're not doing that already, they're probably not worth the amount you're spending on them. Uh, so it really becomes a matter of combining their information and probably a bank account you have that's not affiliated with the property manager and, and putting that into a context that's good for you. But it has to start with a better understanding of who you're dealing with and not just giving them advice based on a not knowing. Cool. So, so far I picked up from you, Chris, is saying, hey, listen, when you're approaching this concept of like, what do I need to do for my accounting and bookkeeping? First thing I probably want to do is find somebody that I can listen to. And maybe that person has made money the same way I'm looking to make money, right? So if I got six properties and I know Julie has seven properties and, and I'm, I'm working all out of state with that bunch of out of state stuff. And so is Julie, maybe Julie is the right person I talk to and ask her, hey, Julie, what are you doing? What's working for you there? Into it. And then, and then like, there's also a second consideration, which is, well, determining the complexity of the kind of help you need can depend upon your scope and your needs. Like multi-state has a bigger scope, harder to keep track of multiple books from different properties, from different states, from property management, et cetera. And also like leveraging into your team, like your property management team and saying like, hey, are they at least doing the minimum things they need to be doing to facilitate there? Did I capture that right? Or was there any, was there uh, any? Well, only that the listening part, I, I meant more as the person giving the advice uh, is yeah, not the person receiving the advice, but the person giving advice really needs to got a better idea of where that person stands. So uh, not so much. So this would be like, 
you're, you're, you're looking for whoever you're talking to to say, hey, how good of a listener are they? Are they really gathering what it is that I'm really got going on? Right. Are they just giving me advice based on their experience? Or, I mean, do I have anything in common with that person? Um, I mean, because if they don't, then that advice is not going to be terrific. Uh, but I, I was, yeah, talking more as from me personally, when I'm giving people advice, I got to make sure that I stop and listen to them and get more of a bigger picture of where they are in their competency with bookkeeping and, you know, their particular structure before I can give them tailored advice rather than just give generic advice that may or not be helpful. Cool. So then we even have like a new topic in here, right? Which is like competency. And there was like a couple of different things you looked for, which was like, what, what, when we turn into the topic here of like, how do we tell, how do we determine how competent somebody is? Um, what are, what are the key factors that you're looking for? I heard you say before, it's like, I'm looking for some type of accreditation uh, maybe that they have, right? Like uh, maybe they have a degree and like accounting or something like that. Maybe like, um, maybe they have like a same business experience. I would argue if they already have 10 properties, they've had to be doing something already. I mean, you don't, you don't just typically get that overnight 10 at a time. Uh, so I, I'd want to see what their current system is. And uh, if they're asking me, it's probably because they're not happy with their current system or they're just fishing and, and seeing if there's something better. But uh, is years experience important to you, Chris? Like how long they've been doing it? Um, I, I guess the long answer for that is two. Th I, I, I like to put it into two things. One, people with ability and people with ambition. You're hoping to get both, and ability usually comes with years. Uh, ambition usually comes with past experience and how you do, uh, how well you attain it or how well you deal with difficult things. Um, God, can I just answer the question? Yes, years are important. <laughs> oh, but it's a little bit more than years, right? Because you said it's ability and ambition. So we want years will tell you ability, but ambition will um, tell you a little bit about more of like, hey, how many clients have you had? How difficult were, what kind of difficult situations have you had to navigate through? Tell me more about like, what's your, you can also look in here too. This, I think you also have something in here too, is like, what's your thread of success of people helping people that are like me, right? Can I look back at like the history of other people you've seen and said, what's made you be successful in helping all of these other people for me to know that you're actually the right person for me? Um, uh that yeah. we're going into so hey jeff i want to go, go ahead and call on you but before you lost ambition on having your hand raised and uh, hurt your shoulder with that anyway so jeff go ahead and key in for us actually a couple a couple of things come to mind as, as i listen to the discussion um one thing and actually people that i work with tend to be also people who provide value up front without like the expectation of like some compensation i would say that like every I've invested in probably 10 syndication deals and every one of the syndicators that I've worked with are either providing some training up front or they're, they're doing, a, they host a podcast or they, one, one person wrote a book on real estate syndication. And so they're, they're, there's like this, Hey, look, I'm adding to the collective intelligence about this area that I am an expert in. And I don't, you know, just to talk to me, you don't, or just to hear my thoughts, you don't have to like have a like paid consultation up front. Um, th there's like this, you know, and, and these webinars is a great example, right? Like as a result of me attending these over the last couple of months, I'm now working with Pete to, to do my taxes. And so I'm like, he's actually three times more than my previous CPA, but I'm willing to spend that because I feel like I'm getting more value from the these uh these webinars this training that you guys are providing scott so uh that's important i, I also talked to another company that actually i don't know i am making give away who they are by saying this but they have a podcast on real estate and uh they sent a t they sent me like it cost 2500 dollars to do this consultation and they sent me this template that had, didn't have my name and didn't have my properties correct in it. So they had like two, it was just a template of like, this is our go-to move. To Chris's point about listening, it was like, yeah, Jeff told us like what his circumstances are, but we have the standard template that we, you know, charge 2,500 for, and we just do a cut and paste 
Jeff's property names in the appropriate places in this, you know, 20 page tax strategy template. And I was like appalled, like, are you kidding me? Like, this is just a document that you've reused, you know, who knows how many numbers of times you haven't done any customization for me. You've just cut and pasted my information into your standard template and you're charging me a whole bunch of money for it. So uh, that listening part and really thinking about like what's unique about this person's situation and, and not just regurgitating like my standard answer, but trying to customize that answer to that person. But I was picking up from you, Jeff, in here is that we had as our three, our third thing we might want to look for when saying like, hey, what are we going to look for for help inside of our bookkeeping? We talk about like, hey, you want to find somebody who's really listening to you, right? And like somebody that can help you think through like your scope and your needs with some specificity here. And then also it's like, hey, how good are they at providing in like upfront value without actually paying them a dollar? Right. And this might tell us that says like, are they actually like a give, are they an education oriented company? Are these, is, are these giving people but like education really says like, these are people that really want to give, they really want to see like some success actually happen because what we've seen, what happens if it's not education, well, then I'm spending a bunch of money and I don't see the value. Right. I just did a thing, but I don't see the value in the thing. Right. And even if there were value in the thing, you're not educated enough to be able to see where the value is in the thing. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that that's the case, right? But I'm saying like the, the piece that we're critically missing here is saying like, well, we know that if people lead with education for us, then that gives us a, a much higher belief that whatever the work is I'm gonna do with them is actually gonna be valuable that comes out of it. Instead of just like, here's a template. Now go figure out what you wanna do next. Into it. Is that right? Cool. So that might help us here in profiling out, like where do we start to listen uh, uh, of like, who are we going to connect with um, that is going to be able to help us through this, this, bookkeeping, this bookkeeping journey. And was there anything else that came top of mind for you on, we had this idea of like competency and maybe that education is like another piece. Education led tells us that people are more competent. If they're leading with education, that tells us that they're a more competent type of service provider it comes into it because they can actually give away all the information for free and still say, yeah, and you're still going to want to hire me even after I tell you all my tricks because you're going to want to see it executed. What well, else comes I into us, guys? To add, Scott. Yeah, Brandon, go ahead. Um, I think uh, ability to communicate um, and being a great listener is, is part of that. But it's not, it's not all of it. It needs to go the other way also. The, um, the, the partner that you're going to work with has to be able to uh, communicate stuff to, to you at the appropriate level. And that's, that's a challenge, you know, I think, I think we've all faced either the, 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 the professional who, who can't dumb it down enough for you or the the partner who assumes that everybody is is in I don't use pejoratives here but assumes everyone is at a much lower level and so they they can't um so let's rephrase it Brennan if it were a positive statement of what you were looking for right instead of not what you don't want what would that look like I want them to be able to to speak to me on my level um not dumb it down and not speak over, over my level of, of comprehension. So they need to be able to suss out, you know, what, what level I'm going to be able to, to speak at, what level I'm going to be able to understand at. So I heard, I heard two things in there, just to clarify into it, because there was two different points that I heard you made. One was to say, I want them to speak at my level, right? I don't want them to dumb it down, right? But I also want them so it was like, it was like, I noticed there's a polarity in there because it was like, I don't want them to dumb it down, but I also want them to give me all the info, right? And yeah. so it's like, they actually need to be able to say, well, how do, how does one ensure, or what is that communication that's like that ensures that somebody working with Brendan is always speaking at his level and it's not over his head or under his head? Yeah, so that's, that's someone who needs to be able to, to, um, you know, negotiate the protocol, so to speak, between the two individuals to understand what, what their capabilities are. So, you know, it would be someone who, you know, like, like Scott, you're asking me about how I'm approaching bookkeeping 
and you're listening well to be able to understand what I'm doing, what my pain points are and, and all of that. And then you can kind of figure out, um, you know, do I understand what a PL is? Do I understand what different accounts are? Do I understand how those flow through to a tax return or, or something like that? You can kind of judge the, you know, my ability to understand some of these comments. And then if you get to the point where you're talking about, uh, you know, CPA certification stuff, that's above me, you're going to figure out, okay, he doesn't understand that language. I need to, to, to pull it down a little bit. But if I'm going to maximize the value of, of working with someone, you know, I don't need them giving me a template. I don't need them giving me something that, uh, you know, spending that one-on-one um, -on -one time just rehashing old stuff that I already know. If I'm going to be paying someone, or, or engaging in a relationship with, with a professional, I want the most value I can get from them. Well, Chris, what do you got? Well, I, I guess I also want to kind of fine tune that there's two different kinds of people we're talking about here. One is just a straight bookkeeper, which I have a totally different set of expectations. You know, if they're strictly bookkeeping, I mean, sometimes a virtual assistant, you know, from the other side of the world could be enough of what you want just to get the information into the right place. Uh, but I, I feel like we're kind of going less toward bookkeeping and more toward CPA slash CFO kind of uh, level. Uh, and, and that's where I tend to get a bit more granular. And, you know, especially as you grow, you know, finding somebody who is, is, is really an expert in in real estate. I mean, assuming we are talking about real estate here, there's a lot of CPAs and uh, accountants out there, but not all of them have expertise in, in real estate. They're just two jack of all trades and bring everybody in. And I have found a lot of value in, in those kind of people that, you know, focused on real estate, have really good advice about real estate. Uh, I know this is going to sound kind of weird, but they're really excited about real estate. You know, maybe they do some of it in their own life. They, you know, me personally, whether I'm being paid or not, I just love talking about that specific subject matter. Uh, and isn't that one of the beautiful things about being an entrepreneur is that you can pick the people you work with? I mean, it's one of the biggest reasons I'm in it. I, I, did, I did a really okay in the business world when I was part of a bureaucracy, really okay. Uh, but I never excelled because if there was anybody I didn't respect or didn't want to work with, it's, re it's much harder for me to fake it. It's much harder for me. Um, so being an entrepreneur is important to me and, and utilize it. If, if you're if working with somebody and you don't like them, cut them off. I don't care how much money somebody makes for me. If they're <laughs> a negative person or, or don't give me the value that they need, uh, they've got to go. Uh, the last thing I'm going to mention here too is if somebody's really focused, really excited, but their timing just sucks. You know, they have too many clients, they're bringing you your tax documents last minute, uh, and they're just putting you on pins and needles all the time because even though their work product is good, it's just, you can't sleep at night because you don't know if your tax return was turned in. Um, so that's very important too. And, and are they available for you when you need that timely advice? Cool. Um, so I pulled a couple of things from, uh, from the last two shares to, to pull in for us here, guys. So one that we talked about is like, it was around, Brenda was talking about the communication and like, can they speak at my level? Are they real? And um, are they really understanding my current capabilities that I have? And can they speak at my level? Um, and then we said for a protocol that we would say, well, how are we going to find out whether this person that we're interviewing to help us here um, these are like, these are some of the questions that we might want to ask them and that we would expect of them to ask of us. It's like, what are you currently doing with your real estate? And if their answer is, well, I'm not doing anything with my real estate, it says, well, now they've, they failed one of our competency requirements. That doesn't mean we necessarily don't work with them, but they're not a real estate investor, right? Say, so, well, cool. That tells us enough there. So what kinds of quality questions can they ask me about what I'm doing? Can they really understand my current capabilities and what's going on in my world with the questions that they're currently doing here? Or do they jump to something else? So it might tell us that, hey, and we understand that high quality relationships start at this level of understanding what are you currently doing and what are the current capabilities that we have? These two areas. 
So anybody that we would go and talk to, we're evaluating them, not just on their knowledge and their competency, but also what is the, the, the method by which you, professional who's talking to me, is evaluating me? Can I tell about how good you are at your job by how you're evaluating me as an intake? Because that'll tell me how well you're actually thinking through the problems and knowing like what's going to be the appropriate level of advice. And then from there, what we'd be looking for is, is, is them to help guide us through um, setting a baseline of where are we at currently, right? This is understanding more of our capabilities. And can they tell us what's our plan for upskilling? How are you going to help me get any better in these areas? How are you going to help facilitate my better knowledge about what's going to happen into it? And that becomes part of their competency. When we looked at all of these competency factors, right, we have a bunch here. Are they a real estate investor? Are they in the same business experience with like maybe a similar number of properties and quantities? Do they have excitement about like what it is that the work that they're doing? Does it look like they have the appropriate workload or are they over? They have too many clients to really be able to service at the level that I need. Um, and are they available? Now, quick, the, these two pieces here too, I would also say as, uh, as a customer or a client of anybody of that professional is to set the baselines of what your expectations are here and the very beginning of your relationship. To ask someone they're going through here, these are my expectations. Are you going to be able to meet those? And not to do business unless they can say, yep, I, I, we are very crystal clear on what those expectations look like. And that's inside of something I can meet for you. Because otherwise you don't know whether to fire them or not after the first go. And you need to know when it's the right time to fire people. And the best way to know to fire people is to have really clear expectations and let them break them, right? And let them fail. So you say, great, not you. I need to find the next person. Because if I, if I have really clear expectations and you can't meet it, then I need somebody else in my life. Because there's enough people out there that can make crystal clear expectations and actually follow through with them that I don't have to negotiate around what, what that's going to be. We also talked about highly competent professionals are going to be education led and that they're going to have some type of like years of experience of ability, ambition, but we want them to have some type of time in, but also like what are the number of clients and what are the kinds of difficult problems they solved? Maybe I'm a really easy client, right? But I know I'm growing. So maybe I want to know what are the more difficult matters that they've come across. Right. And that would tell us like, great, well, wherever I'm growing and however I'm growing, is this person going to be able to grow with me? Are they going to be able to take on the additional pieces that I have? Because the more I can leverage into a single relationship, the more valuable that relationship comes for me because the relationships are expensive. They don't always work out. They only work out about 34% of the time if you trust HR statistics on what professional relationships look like inside of the work environment. Um, and it takes up a bunch of our time and our time is the one resource they're not making any more of. So more important than cost, you might consider it's how much time do I need to develop new relationships or be able to leverage into those teams, especially if they can meet all of these other competency requirements that we've had. And then lastly, I'm looking for some type of threat of success. What is it that makes you powerful? And I can see consistently time and time again, that you're doing with people that you can explain to me that makes you successful in supporting them, Mr. CPA, right? And they should be able to tell you the story about people they've helped that are like you and how they helped them, why that was powerful, why that was important, right? Um, and shifting, because they should also be able to talk you through this. Are you, should I be self-managing? Should I have somebody else do it? Or should I hire this out as a professional? What are the considerations that are going to come for me here, right? And that's going to be part of this threat of success type of topic, right? Their threat of success should diagnose down into the same thing we were talking about before as understanding the capabilities. And that tells you where is this person at and those main buckets for it. Um, go ahead, Chris. Well, I, I first just want to mention, thank you so much, Scott, for showing us your, your, your note-taking skills, because I'm actually learning some things that uh, I, I could utilize myself. It's, it's very helpful, and it's thank you for that. Um, a couple of more competency things that came to mind for me is I'm really always looking for somebody. I mean, or actually, for me personally, I, it's important to have somebody who's very creative. Uh, someone who's not who's willing to fight and to be in in the gray sometimes when it comes to saving for taxes and such. Uh, but that's not important for everybody. I'll give you the opposite extreme. If somebody is in retirement. They have always been a very conservative person and they want an accountant or a bookkeeper uh, to be as conservative as possible. And, and the even thought of losing money is not something or having an audit just freaks them out. Then you want an accountant that goes in that direction. 
or you want somebody who does both, but is really good at reading their clients and gives them advice based on their risk tolerance. Uh, so that's, ex I guess those two things. It's the creativity and knowing the risk tolerance of, of your particular client and what you're looking for in, in an accountant as well. It's got to match. So this is a question that I always ask everybody. I'll give you guys, this is my, uh, this is one way that Scott Smith actually vets people as well too. Well, I, you guys, you guys know I'm a litigator, right? So when I'm talking about tax issues or asset protection issues, contract, et cetera, what I'm always worried about is think of litigation risk, right? Meaning uh, if I get into a lawsuit, how, what's my likelihood of winning this lawsuit, whether it's going to be a breach of contract issue or whether it's going to be, Hey, I got audited. Audits are just lawsuits, right? It's just an investigation before a lawsuit, right? That happens. So when I talk to uh, my tax professionals into it, when I'm, when I asked them, I said, Hey, are you a white hat operator or a black hat operator or somewhere in between? White hat means I'm totally pure. I'm going to do everything by the book in the most conservative reading of that information I possibly could do. Black hat says, I'll do some stuff for you, but you might go to jail, right? Into it. So black hats, we don't, we don't work with black hats, right? Because jail is not an acceptable outcome, right? Even if you can get out of it because like, hey, they can get it pled down to some type of uh, civil penalty or something like that. I think it's just too stressful and there's not enough juice to be worth the squeeze on having somebody lingering with like putting jail time over my head of whatever I'm doing. If I'm just played out, the only thing I care about is money, right? Into it, still jail is not acceptable outcome for what it happens for me, right? So for some people it is, right? And we see those people out on the streets doing whatever they're doing, right? They're, they're money making in jail time, they're okay with that kind of risk. I think that's a little too rough for me. So what I do is I ask them, well, if you rate it on the scale of zero to 10 and zero is, hey, I'm the most conservative I could possibly be. And I, I read everything into that light. And 10 is the most aggressive I could possibly be. Where, where do you, you want to set? And what I find is a lot of people will say seven. And what I tell them is you can't pick seven. You can pick zero to six or you can pick eight to 10. Oh. Seven is a cop-out number into it. But I want to know where do you where do you where do you see yourself fitting end of year, right? And then what this tells me is when they tell me whatever that number is going to be, that tells me, okay, who am I dealing with here? What's their comfortability with risk, right? As it comes into it. And then the other piece too is is the more that I go this way onto this timeline, the more expensive my professional advice becomes. Because what that actually means is I'm threading here is I got a big needle I can thread to be okay. And the farther I go this way, the more that I need really specific advice and really high level advice, because why? Because if I guess wrong, do I go to jail? And so I'm like, cool, this is where I might need want tax attorneys, high level CPAs, et cetera, which means great. I, it makes financial sense for me to get more aggressive with my litigation risk to high, spend more money on professionals. But what does that really mean? That means I need to be making some serious cheese to get this aggressive because my professional help on making sure I'm on the right side has to be dialed in. But if ever, Scott, can't you say that? I mean, there's also a big difference between something where you lose money and something that you're going to go to jail. I mean, if, if this litigation risk is on a, a zero or a one to 10 scale of specifically going to jail, then I'm as white hat as you can get. I, I'm not going to jail. I don't well, want to. What I'm getting at is it's non binary. That the questions, if, if it's criminal activity and potential criminal charges, I never will be okay with that. Right. 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 I'm only I mean, okay paying civil really penalties. Oh, you go ahead. Sorry. I'm only okay paying civil penalties because then I understand it's a money-making game, right? And we're all playing this money-making game together about how aggressive are we going to be. So anything that has a potential misdemeanor or felony charge to it um, you, is off the table, right? But I, I will play the game of how much does it cost for me to thread the civil side of things because then there's the cost benefit, right? The cost is on one side is my attorney and CPA cost, and I need that to be less than the um, the payoff of whatever I think doing that strategy is actually risk reward. Yeah, it's just a simple risk reward, but I'm using risk reward in terms of what my attorney and CPA cost. So this might be a little bit more advanced than most people in this group would need, but I want to just open up the kimono a little bit and show you guys at like what another level of how business people um, that we have here can think through some of these issues. Um, let's hit Jeff and Julie, and then I realize we're at time, guys. So sorry for running us a little over today. But Jeff, why don't you go ahead and go first, and then Julie will catch you next, and we'll wrap up. I, I was only going to say this is actually something important for people. My dad uh, had started a business with his best friend, and I think they had different profiles on that tolerance. And so ultimately, their business split apart. 
similarly, my youngest, uh, one of my brothers, he, he had a business with a partner. And I think it's important when you do business with people that you guys have similar values because I think that's where partnerships might fall apart. But I think Julie actually had her hand up longer than I did. So I'll let her go. And I, I want to just point out to you is remember, this is, uh, that's planning what you're talking about, Jeff, right? Do we plan in a line before we started to act? Same thing, Mike, Chris might also tell us about this great partnership that went south. Do we really plan in a line before we acted? And how expensive that is when we don't. And right. that's what I'd say, as I just underscored is, that's why you have these these professionals that we talked about here with high levels of competency because they, if they've walked through enough of these years of experience a number of cases they're going to sniff out where you could screw this up where you might not already see it and that's what really good like these high level competent professionals should be helping you cover off on watching your back on pieces because that's why they're so specialized that's what makes them so important because i've done it so many more times and that they have the benefit of having that just very detailed focus and narrow focus in their life uh, to help you lever up in a way that would take you a long time to lever up on your own. Go ahead, Julie. I think one thing that helps me a lot in terms of bookkeeping is to have different bank accounts for different purposes. Um, for example, I have a bank account for my active business as sole proprietor, another bank account for LLC, another bank account bank account for personal expenses. If you have multiple businesses, have different bank accounts. And then before your income and expenses happen, you already determine which account it goes to. Now that's going to help your bookkeeping to be a lot clearer because you don't have to spend time to recategorize them. And also it helps the assets protection because you never want to put any personal income or expenses into your LLC account because if that LLC account bank account get audited or subpoenaed then your um, corporation uh, veil can be pierced because you put personal account in that and then there uh, the, your asset production is gone so um, make them separate and then have different cards or bank accounts and then predetermining where you tunnel those expenses to. Awesome. So Julie, Julie's given us a little bit of like, here's our a system hack, right? Where it says, well, great. If you just took your active income, your passive income and your personal and said, hey, these are gonna be separate bank accounts with separate credit cards. That's gonna help us categorize everything in your QuickBooks or whatever your accounting software happens to be. And then it's also gonna help you ensure that you're, you're preserve your asset protection and for everything you need to do on that front of it, because it's gonna be appropriately categorized, which is what we know is important for us for piercing the corporate veil or other corporate protection um, issues. So Julie, thanks for um, outlining that, that strategy. This is a super powerful strategy as a baseline. When you're still in this phase, year two, and doing self-management, Julie's the right, Julie's a great person to talk to, it sounds like. She's got a great little system that keeps things really clear for her about what needs, what needs to happen. And maybe one of these future sessions we'll be able to dive in deeper around this idea of the self-management. Um, since in this episode, I think we went uh, really deep into some super high level considerations of, of business and CPAs and whatnot. But I wanted to take the time to do that today so we can at least see the full map of, hey, as I'm growing into my first million dollars net worth, my first $5 million net worth, my first company, my 10th company, what does that system play out to be? And what are the considerations I need to know? Because if not, what happens is, is you're looking out into the world wondering, am I doing the right stuff? And I hear all of these people doing all of these different things. And how do I know that I'm doing the things that are appropriate for me, right? So that was the purpose that we're getting today is like, I hope everybody can see coming out of this episode of like, hey, this is the lane I'm in. This is what's appropriate for me. These are the types of things I'm looking for and the people I want to attract into my world. And I need to get really clear about what it is exactly that I'm looking for when I go to talk to that person. What do I want them to be asking me about? How do I want them to be answering questions that I ask them? And what are those responses going to be that tells me that's the right person? And we can dig into some more of that into uh, how do we vet, we're going to be vetting professionals, but also how are we going to be doing self-management since I know a lot of us do uh, self-management here. So thank you, Julie, uh, Chris, uh, Jeff, and Brendan for all of your participation in here today. 
Um, we're gonna go ahead and pick up any of the questions that people have on the Discord channel. If you're not in the Discord channel, hop into there with any questions you have coming out of here today around bookkeeping. Um, if you want looking for like links and other information or other uh, resources that we might be able, that, that us as a community can help each other with and being able to upskill in this area. Um, and if you find yourself being a place that you're, you're maybe too shy to talk here in the group, that's a great place to be able to do it and get some additional support um, that I know that me and the professional team, as well as some of our uh, strong members of the community interact well uh, through that Discord channel. So thank you guys so much uh, for joining in today. Um, very much uh, my pleasure uh, to be able to lead us through this discussion today. Can't tell you how ecstatic I am about the level of wisdom that we have here inside of this group, uh, pulling together issues that I think are, you could spend a whole week in a seminar and spend $10,000 to get this kind of education uh, that would come into it of like, how does this stuff work? And, uh, and I just think that's rad that we get the opportunity to be able to create that for each other. So thank you guys so much for all coming in and being a part of, of the great stuff that we're creating here in service to each other.